five. So we are going to do the book of Micah tonight. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and um, I do have my notes up here. And we're going to do a, a little bit differently. Normally, I'm, I'm reading and commenting as we go through. There's there's each chapter doesn't have a whole lot that I need to comment on. So I'm going to have other people read a chapter at a time. And we can go back and kind of comment on those parts of the chapter that uh, we want to comment on, uh, to uh, elaborate on. It's seven chapters. We should be able to get through all seven chapters tonight, even if we are st starting a bit later. But um, just kind of going through again, we, we, we've dealt with a, a quarter of the major prophets and going through Isaiah. We've already gone through Amos and Hosea. Um, Micah is a contemporary of all three of those prophets. Uh, and preached to both the northern and southern kingdoms at that time. And so there's some overlap, um, some familiarity in what we're talking about here. It's not a whole lot that's new here. Uh, there are a few nuggets that we can pull out. Um, but um, just want to kind of go through this so we get a good full understanding of how the prophecies work. And, and it's important, again, uh, you know, when you go to we did the book of revelation years ago now and all the imagery there similar imagery in these prophecies and, and so that's uh important to hear so why don't we start with chapter one who wants to read chapter one the word of the lord came to micah of morasus shias in the days of jotham and hazaz and Hezekiah, king of Judah, concerning what he saw as it relates to Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear these words, O people. Give heed, O earth, and all that it is in it. For the Lord God shall be among you for a witness against you, the Lord from his holy house. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place. He will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. The mountains will shake under him, and the valley shall melt like wax before the fire like water pouring down a steep incline. All of this is for the transgressions of Jacob and the sin of the house of Israel. What is the transgressions of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the sin of the house of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? I will make Samaria become as a shed in the field and a vineyard for planting, and I will tear down her stones in confusion and expose her foundations. And they shall cut all her graven images into pieces and burn down all her houses of prostitution with fire. And I shall utterly destroy all her idols. For she gathers from the price of prostitution and has accumulated from the price of a harlot. On account of this, she will wail and lament. She will walk barefoot and naked, beating her chest in mourning as a serpent and mourn as the daughters of Siren, for a calamity overwhelms her, for it has come to Judah as far as the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. Those of Goth do not exalt yourselves, and those of the house of Aphrath do not build, rebuild your house from the laughter. Sparkle dust, sprinkle dust on your laughter, the one living in Shafar, Shafar, dwelling in comfortability in her cities, did not come to mourn her neighbor. <coughs> she received a calamity of grief from you. Who has begun to do good for her who dwells in distress? For evil have come down from the Lord upon the gates of Jerusalem, even the sound of a chariot and horsemen. Those dwelling in Washim, she was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Because of this, he will cause men to be sent forth as far as the inheritance of Gath, vain houses, for they have become vanity to the kings of Israel, until they bring the heirs to you. O inhabitants of Lachesh, the inheritance shall come as far as Adullam even the glory of the daughter of Israel. Shave your hair, 
and make your head bald as an eagle for the sake of your precious children. Increase your wind widowhood where they have been taken captive. Thank you. Okay, so again, similar story of uh, the you know the Israel has strayed from the Lord, and there's going to be a, a, a reckoning for that. First, I should say Micah. The, the name Micah means one who is like God or like unto God. Make a um, Mike Michael. Um, the name Michael Mikael similar in. in uh, structure to that um and so as we go through you know verse three here where he says for behold the lord is coming out of his place right so christ came left left the throne at the right hand of god the father and came down to uh take on flesh he'll come down and tread the high places of the earth um so the son left his pl place to come among us which is ultimately a, a benefit for us because we have salvation that comes from that but it's good that the son came and not the father because if the father comes you do not want him to leave his heavenly place uh when the father comes we're in trouble you no know, remember christ is our mediator between us and the father and and christ kind of smooths the way for us with the father if it's the father who comes it's not a good thing. So we do not want him to come and, and be among us. Uh, verse four, the mountains will shake under him and the valleys will melt like wax before the fire. Again, uh, familiar for, for us from Paschal time, like water pouring down a steep incline. Uh, the waters are the waters of baptism flowing from the heavens, right? So it's not just, you know, one, <laughs> one time we were talking clergy we're talking about you know the waters of baptism make this water be like the waters of the jordan if you've ever been to the jordan river not the cleanest <laughs> source of water that you've ever seen and so no don't look like that we're, but you know, what we're talking about is waters from heaven so um you know with that um and all of this and, and again i said he, he's preaching to the northern and southern kingdoms and so and we read in verse five here, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the sin of the house of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So the sins of the Southern kingdom are the same as the sins of the Northern kingdom and vice versa. Um, you can't say one kingdom is better than the other. And if you go back to the histories, right? They separated because they thought one was better than the other. And at the end of, of all this, God's saying, no, you're both the same. <laughs> it's not it's, there's no better there it's all the pain yeah um ultimately and and then we go through and read all of the criticism of, of israel uh until 16 shave your hair and make your head as bald as an eagle for the sake of your precious children increase your widowhood for they have been taken captive um so eagles lose their plumage as they get older until they get sort of bald and the whole point of that is um you know, not, not only is it kind of the imagery of the crucifixion, but when we shave our head and it, it's a, a lamentation and we do this for the sake of our children. Okay, the, the criticism or condemnation has come upon us, our generation, but maybe we can save the generation to come by lamenting and repenting ourselves, much as like we will get to Job but, or, or even Jonah when, you know, uh, Nineveh, that great city, repented and, and was saved. So, okay. Chapter two, who wants to read that? Uh, they devised wickedness and were scheming evil on their beds. And at daybreak, they put their plan up into action, but they did not lift their hands to, the, uh, to God. They coveted fields and plundered orphans. They oppressed families and plundered a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am devising evils against this tribe from which you shall not lift up your neck, nor will you suddenly walk upright, for this is a time of evil. And that day, and that day, a parable shall be taken up against you, and a dirge will be uh, wailing, saying, In misery we have suffered hardship. The portion of my people uh, has been measured out with a measuring line, and there has no one, I mean, and there was no one who was able to stop it. Our fields have been divided among them. Therefore, there will not 
there will be no one to put out a measuring line uh, for a lot of you in the assembly of the Lord. Do not shed tears, nor even weep over these things, for he will not dismiss the reproaches. Who says, the house of Jacob has provoked the spirit of the Lord. Are these not his practices? Are not his words good with them? And have they not proceeded as predicted? And previously, for enmity of for enmity, my people resisted against his peace. They played his skin to remove hope and the ravages of war. Therefore, the, uh, those leading my people will be cast out of their luxurious homes. They have been driven out because of their wicked practices, uh, drawn near to the everlasting mountains. Arise and depart, for this is not a final resting place for you on account of your uncleanness. You have been utterly destroyed by corruption. You are pursued by no one pursuing. You pursued a spirit built on falsehood. It drips on you into the wine and the intoxicating drink. And by reason of the drop of this people, it shall happen. Jacob will be completely gathered together with all of them. I shall wait, expecting the remnant of Israel by him. I will cause the return as sheep in trouble, as a flock in the midst of their fold, from the breach made, made before them. They will rush out from among their captors. They will break through the gates of captivity, and their king comes out before their presence, and the Lord shall lead them. Okay, so... Um, verse 2 there, they covered fields and plundered orphans, they oppressed families and plundered a man in his house, a man in his inheritance, right? So we are called to protect and provide for the less fortunate, the orphans, the widows, all of those things that um, the Israel ceased to do that was a condemnation on them. And again, we were talking earlier about any comparisons between Israel and, and America when we cease to protect the orphans and the widows and things like that. Also, we have a similar uh, situation. Um, let me go to verse eight. And previously for his enmity, my people re resisted against his peace. They played his skin to remove hope in the ravages of war. Again, kind of re referring to the crucifixion. Uh, nine, therefore, those leading my people will be cast out of their luxurious homes They've been driven out because of their wicked practice, draw near to the everlasting mountains. In Micah in particular, although it is similar throughout the scriptures, but when we talk about going to the mountains, to the high place, that's the church, okay, the, the sanctuary of the church. In fact, so behind the altar, there's a large crucifixion with Christ on it, right? And on the solea, there's a big throne that the bishop normally sits in. Okay, those are very modern, that throne is a very modern thing. Not that it's modern in the sense that the throne was there, but that was the emperor's throne. That was where Constantine the emperor sat, not the bishop. The bishop actually would have sat behind the altar area where the crucifix is. And so when the priest goes and senses that area, he's not necessarily, although because there is a cru crucifixion with Christ on it, I am sensing Christ there. But really I'm, what I'm sensing there is where the bishop is supposed to be sitting. Okay, so that's and, and by the way, when we refer to that as clergy, we go to the high place, okay? That's re referred to as the high place. When the bishop is sitting, that's the high place, okay? So that's the sanctuary. Is there a reason why we can't, why it switched? Yes. Ottoman occupation took the bishop out of the altar and put him in the throne and put a crown on top of his head and made him the not only the religious, but the civil leader. So we were talking about with the Pope of Rome, that happened in the fourth, fifth, sixth centuries was done by the Turkish occupation in the 15th century. And so we kind of have kept that till today, even though really our bishops are still not really civil leaders, even if, if they represent one. So any saint that you'll see from before Ottoman occupation won't be having a crown on his head because the bishops didn't wear a crown. That, that was specifically done when the so emperor said, "You need you wear the crown now." Yeah, the Turks said, "You're you're not only the religious now; you're the civil leader." We don't want to deal with these people. Ah, uh, okay. You deal with them, and if we have a problem with them, we're going to come to you. So he became the liaison between the two. He became the mediator between the Turkish government and right. the Christian peoples. Um, so, yeah, which, as we talked about earlier, happened in Rome earlier on because of just out of necessity but that's like regardless it isn't it's 
So the bishop represents Christ, represents God, and it makes sense to sit at the table. Right. But even when the the your throne is there, when it's empty, you're it's it's still Christ. The bishop, but it's Christ. It's, it's Christ that I'm sensing, which is why the first thing the priest does when he comes out to, to sense is he senses the throne. Mm -hmm. And I had one parishioner back in California say, the bishop isn't that important. Why are we sensing him first? And it's like, well, we're, we're not. <laughs> 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 Correct. He's not that important. Yeah. And, and that's why we're not sensing him. <laughs> we're sensing Christ, who is important, by the way. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's why that's the first thing we do. Uh, verse 11 seems a little strange, right? It, it, kind of hard to understand. You were uh, pursued by no one pursuing. You pursued a spirit built on a falsehood. It drips on you into the wine and the intoxicating drink. And by reason of the drop of this people, it shall happen. So John Cassian, which is a early father of the church, um, right, explains about this, that Micah is saying, I wish I were lying and and lost my status as a prophet if Israel could escape the punishment and the destruction uh, he was prophesying about. So basically what this is saying is you have to trust what I'm saying because I'm prophesying and my prophecy is true. If I if I could take it back or say that I was making this up, I would do so willingly because what I'm saying is not good. <laughs> it's a it's a bad thing. So uh, I wish I could say otherwise, but I can't. Um, and then 13, they will break through the gate of captivity and their king comes out before their presence and the Lord shall lead them. So this is breaking the bonds of this world. If we're led by Christ, we're led into the kingdom. Uh, and so be led by him, not by the things of this world. So, so who's, is it God the Father, God the Son, or God the Spirit that is giving the words of prophecy to the prophet. It's the spirit. And we'll actually see that later on. It, it, Micah specifically says that. And it's the Holy Spirit that's prophesying. But we say it in the creed, right? Yeah. Who spoke through the prophets. So it's the Holy Spirit that's working through them. So in some of the other readings, when people are talking to God, who are they speaking to? God, the Trinity, or the individual? We have to be careful not to get too... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's always God. Right. Whether it be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's still God. And yes, there are three persons, but they're all working together. Um, and it's one of the things that... that so like the anaphora, when, when we say the prayers for the consecration, the prayers before the consecration, uh, we pray to you and your son and Holy Spirit. So clearly we're addressing God the Father, even though it's still God and even though it's still the three persons of the Trinity that are, that are there, which is why we're, we're talking to the Father, who is the fountainhead, but we're not excluding, obviously. We're not saying, Father... We're approach, addressing you, whether or not the Son and the Spirit agree or not. You know, no, we're not going to, we don't want to. But when, so when you said, we don't want God the Father to come here. So in the icons of the, of the, um, of paradise, mm -hmm. of the creation, it's Christ. It's Christ. Mm -hmm. Written in the icon. Yep. Because, is it because we know what he looks like? Or, and in, you know, in the baptism of Christ, you have the Trinity is all there, mm -hmm. the voice of God, the spirit and, mm -hmm. and Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So, because people ask that question mm -hmm. in the, in the bookstore, um, you know, right. why is this? And, and it's because Christ is the one that comes onto the earth. Because he became incarnate, mm -hmm. because he took on creation. The creation that he himself created right. but he, he became matter and saint john damascus really drives this home in his uh treaties on this on when we were the, the orthodox church was discussing iconography um and he says because christ became matter we can depict him 
and we can depict the Holy Spirit in as much as we understand or have a, a physical description of it, whether it be tongues of fire or the dove. Okay, uh, and it's, we we have to be clear that the Holy Spirit is not a dove. He came in the form of a dove. He is not fire. He, he came as tongues of fire. It's a simile. Um, but but right in the in the baptism, oftentimes you'll have sort of this hand coming down and blessing, kind of depicting, in a way, the voice of God the Father blessing. This is my beloved Son. So yes, you have the theophany, the appearance of the, of the Trinity in the baptism, uh, but we only can depict what we physically have. This idea that you know God is above us. Well. Uh, what, what happens to those in Australia, right? You know, <laughs> they're on the wrong side of the, the planet. Um, we, maybe we are. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 these are imagery that we have in human understanding because we are human and we're limited in our understandings. We use things that we can understand. Um, none of it's actual reality. Um, even, again, even, even though Christ took flesh, his flesh now that's resurrected is different than our flesh. It's mm -hmm. it's a deified flesh. It's the flesh that we will all have after the resurrection, after the second coming of Christ. So, you know, we can show what we can show. We can't show what we cannot show. So, you know, again, the old icon of the ancient of days that we had above the uh, real doors yeah. here. Well, they all not, 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 not exactly accurate because you have this old man as God the Father. Well, <laughs> Nobody does. We don't. He doesn't have a physical form, right? Because right? he never took flesh. He never. He, he's he's beyond creation. And whether he's old or not, I mean, that's this is how we age. <laughs> we could see God the Father, and he could be a baby. I mean, you know, uh, we don't know. I so. like it's best when they the, the voice of God, because that could be a talking voice. That could be the wind. That could be just but stillness. Not. It could, yeah. But that's, a, how I, that's how I that's how I think about it. It's an ambiguous word, wind, spirit, mm -hmm. I mean, all sorts of things. It doesn't have substance, right? right? So, which is God, it doesn't have substance. We, we, so we, were, we did watch Oppenheimer at home, and uh, I, asked, I asked Dimitri, I said, so does light have matter or have mass? I said, he said, no. So, might want to rethink that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how does it have mass? That's quantum physics. Yeah, right. I said, you know, this, you probably haven't got there yet. But But when you do, and your teacher asks if it, if light has mass, you say yes, it does. Even if it's just minuscule, it still has mass. But um, but that's kind of the idea of trying to understand God. I mean, you know, Einstein with his theory of relativity is just getting really close to that divine realm of this is kind of beyond us sort of thing, you know, and, you know, that kind of recognition that maybe we can even define it, but it's still a very difficult definition for a lot of us to understand. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, how do we understand that we're like, again, in the Anaphora, we're addressing God the Father. But it's still the Son and the Holy Spirit that are part of that equation. And, and Chrysostom in particular makes sure that we understand because he says it three times. <laughs> Good old Orthodox approach to things, say it three times just for emphasis. And, you know, so we say it three times, but uh, but it isn't addressed to God the Father. But So, yeah. The mystery of Orthodoxy. So... Okay, moving on to chapter three. Who wants to read chapter three? He was saying, hear these things, O heads of the house of Jacob, and you remnant of Israel. Is it not for you to know judgment? You who hate good and love evil, you who see their skins in order to flay them and cut their flesh off their bones, who developed the flesh, who devoured the flesh of my people by removing their skin breaking their bones, and dividing them as merely flesh for the cauldron and meat for the pot. Thus they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not hear them. Instead, 
He will turn his face from them at that time because they have done wickedly in their deeds against themselves. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who were proclaiming peace upon them while they in themselves ate, but who, when nothing was put in their mouths, stirred up their war against them. Therefore to you there will therefore to you there will be darkness instead of vision. And to you, there will be darkness instead of prophecy. But the sun will set on the prophets, and the day will shall become very dark on them. And the seers of dreams will be put to shame, and the prophets will be laughed to scorn. And all the people will speak evil of them, because there will be no one heeding them. Surely I shall strengthen myself in the spirit of the Lord, and of judgment, and of power to proclaim to Jacob his ungodliness and to Israel his sins. Indeed, hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and the remnant of the house of Israel, you who despise judgment and who are perverting everything that is upright, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with injustice. Her leaders make decisions founded on a bribe and her priests give answers for pay and her prophets prophesied for money. And they lean on the Lord, saying, Is not the Lord with us? No harm can come upon us. Therefore, on account of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall be as a shed in the field, and the mountain of the house as a grove of trees. Okay, so verse 1 there, um, you will say, here are these things, O heads of the house of Jacob, and you remnant of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Uh, it's the leaders who bear the greatest responsibility, for they should have known better, right? And so he, this is kind of what the, the Lord is saying, you know, to the people of Israel. It's not just that the Israelites themselves strayed, but it's the people that kind of led them <laughs> and accepted right. their, their straying there. So it's not a, not a good thing. Uh, verse four, you know, a, a, again, just talking about that, that using human language to describe God, right? They, thus they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not hear them instead as if he has ears. Um, instead, he will turn his face from them as if he has a face <laughs> at that time because they have done wickedly their deeds against themselves. And it's ultimately, I mean, you know, people talk about why does God send people to hell? And orthodoxy really doesn't say that we he sends people to hell he kind of gives them what they they ask for themselves right i mean they they send themselves to hell they choose hell for themselves and that's kind of what he says here is they've done this to themselves it's not that god turns away it's that you're not asking for my help you don't want my help you don't want anything to do with me i'm not, am i supposed to force myself upon you god doesn't do that right it's our choice of what path we choose yeah. Correct. Who turned away? Yeah. Right. Who really right. turned he, away? He's here. always there. It's got to be us that makes yeah. that It's more that we turned our face because we have faces, first of all. Right. But secondly, we turn our face away from God. And what is he going to do? You know, I mean. But also, you know, when this is occurring, I mean, you're talking a whole group of people who were, they weren't uneducated because, by, but they were uneducated in what terms we think. They didn't read, they didn't write. Right. So, everything had to be descriptive in Correct. order for them to get a visual it's a visual right exactly exactly um and then five and six thus they you know they the lord say concerning the prophets and this is just talking about false prophecies here um you know the, the darkness falls upon the false prophets um the, their their prophecies do not come to light they don't come true so, yeah um, verse eight, surely I will, shall strengthen myself in the spirit of the Lord. And there you go. Who's, who's speaking here, the spirit of the Lord. Okay. And the judgment and his power to proclaim Jacob, his ungodliness and his Israel, his sins. Um, and then indeed hear this again, the false prophets, you, you heads of the house of Jacob and the remnant of the house of Israel, you who despise judgment and are perverting everything that is upright. You know, so the, the heretics are the ones who take the scriptures take these things and they misinterpret it or they skew it in the wrong direction and use it to, you know, to per pervert uh, what is right by misinterpreting things like the scriptures and heretics do that as they, they, they take something, you know, especially in modern day times, they'll take one passage out of the scripture 
and say, well, this is what this means. Well, you know, are you ignoring everything that came before that and everything that came after that? <laughs> well, and, you know, the one part about these the pay and stuff, I mean, that still goes on today. You know, people scam us for money and they do it in the same fashion. They take something that we're, I hate to say gullible, oh, yeah. but gullible to listen to. Well, and how many, how many televangelists or whatever, send me your money and I'll pray for you. Right. It's like, yeah. Yeah, you know, sacraments can't be bought or paid for. I mean, exactly. you know, uh, so, and it's, you know, it's, well, Father, what, you get a salary. Well, I do have to provide for myself. St. Paul even himself said that. But, you know, I mean, if I start going around in a private plane, right? yeah, you might have a criticism. Well, and your salary is determined by a board and by the church right. itself. It's it, not... It, you making a side gig over here preaching and saying, hey, cough up the coffers here, and then you go out and... And, I, and I'm not skimming off the top. Yes. Right? I mean, so, you know, it, it's... So this is like a is, prophecy for all time. Correct. Because Paul, I don't know, you know me, I don't know what books things come from, but in the epistles, there are several places in the early church where there are people trying, you know, he said, people will pull you away. They will tell you these things. It is not mm -hmm. true. And Christ, it, it, you'll know, you'll know when the second coming is coming. Don't you worry. It won't be subtle. Right. So don't listen to the nonsense. Correct. And this, this is like, this to me, I mean, <clears throat> from what I understand, from what you've said, the prophecies have nothing to do with the people at the moment, have everything to do with the people in the future, although the people in the moment can learn from them, but it's got not, it's not for them, right? It's right. the next generation, generation, generation. And this is like for all time. Correct. Because we all turn our face away from God at some point. Mm -hmm. And if you are fortunate, you turn your face back and say, I, I'm going to open the door. I'll open the door. Right. You repent. Um, metanoita, right? We change, we change your face, our face. Your we change our, our approach. And even the false prophecies. I mean, yeah, we can be from time to time led astray by a teaching that we think at the time makes sense. But the more we explore it, the more we look into it the more we examine it we go wait a minute yeah that wasn't right I, I, even at the councils right yeah and, well <laughs> orthodoxy has, has certainly had its moments where it, it was not going in the right direction and and you know at times i mean you know gregory the theologian when he was patriarch of constantinople had a a, a church that was no bigger than this room in all of Constantinople, because that's how many Orthodox were not following Arianism um, until the, the truth prevailed. And and uh, so, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, it, it, it happens. I mean, and not to say that we shouldn't be upset with ourselves when we do have those moments, but rejoice more when we recognize, yeah, I, I was going the wrong direction and I've made a change, I've repented and um, now I son. can move in the right direction. The prodigal son, right? Prodigal son, exactly. So, I'm glad the Orthodox Church. I'm glad the Catholic Church stopped selling indulgences. <laughs> well, I don't know if they've stopped, but right. <laughs> it's not on the level that they were doing. <laughs> Let's just say that. But you know, I know that there are some probably not just a few Orthodox around the country who probably mm -hmm. believe that if you give enough money, if you give enough money, and there's a lot of people who have a lot of money, that you'll you'll get into heaven. Yes. Because that's, it's not just a Catholic thing. It's not just a Protestant. It, it exists, just human beings think, if you just give enough, someone's going to, whatever it is, wheat, money, you know, water, that's going to get me to where I need to be. A lot of people on top of that, to caveat what you said, has to do with, um, they'll 
give money and they'll consider that enough of a substitute versus their time. Whereas mm -hmm. for me, I'm of the view, yeah, I can become rich, but I still want to also volunteer. There's little, even if it is a little bit of time, I'm a busy person, but even a little bit of time matters rather than just write a check. Anyone can write a bloody check and we can drop money into there. But if you don't take even some time to physically put yourself there, then it, does it really mean anything? Because you could easily just why well, wrote a check on it. And that's kind of like that. So some people think tithing the 10% is as long as I need that in a monetary fashion, yeah. then I'm good. And yep. they don't realize that that's <clears throat> not what it's all about. It, but that's the simple way to do it. I've met my obligation. So I'm, I'm good. I'm clear. It's one element. Right. We should be contributing financially to the well-being right. of the church, but it's one element. As one of my good brother priests said, we do not have a hierarchy. We do not have a democracy as a church. We have a plutocracy, which is the wealthy make the decisions in the church. And unfortunately, sometimes that is the case is if you have enough money, you can yeah. steer the boat, if you will. And that's not exactly how the church should be running. But I think mm -hmm. that sometimes that's not even about the money aspect of it. I, I see this in obviously working in mediation. You see that a lot because it's a lot of people who have a lot of money mm -hmm. in there. And so sometimes it's not even because they that person has bought the way. That person is used to being commanded mm -hmm. because usually they, they've made that money by running a business or, or inherited where they've had servants and everything else. Mm -hmm. Other people sometimes are intimidated by them. So they, they steer the boat simply because other people are too afraid to stand up to them because they have so much money. Or they're afraid if they say no, they're not that 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 stream of income might yes. go yeah. away. Mm -hmm. Which is why, you know, and and in my experience in this parish, we have we are blessed for the most part in the sense where people give and there's not a lot of i mean they might have a little suggestions or whatever but it's it's not demanding um i mean i don't feel like i've ever been put in a situation where i had to say i have to do this because the person gave me the money or i have to give the money back right no so far <laughs> to this point I, I don't feel like i've been put in that position there was a time in 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 one situation in santa barbara where i literally gave a, a check back to somebody because the demands placed upon the money were so strict that I didn't feel I could, I could hold up to the demands and I did not want to take the money to put myself in a position where I, I either had to sacrifice my ideals or fear that I would fail. Right. Um, it happened one time, um, but it did happen. And, and, so those things do happen and um i think the i'm just a lowly parish priest but when you start to get into the element of being a bishop and you're dealing with it on a far larger level yes. and and more times than than not and your your situation may not just affect your archdiocese or metropolis but also your parishes or or multiple parishes yes. the demands i think are uh, on a different level and and it's one of the one of the one of the reasons i thank god he did not call me to be a bishop <laughs> that is above yeah, that's a very hard discernment <laughs> uh, 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 i'm not on that level and i don't don't wish to be on that level and sometimes when bishops say what well, what should i do i say well I've... <laughs> <laughs> that's your decision <laughs> not my service not my right. <laughs> that's your calling not mine right. good luck with that <laughs> so you not take you kind of have deep pockets i don't care if, if it doesn't if they don't see it to be a benefit to the church i tend to be the one who will rock a boat and i've been had my collar yanked before to basically be told shut up because uh he pays for too much. Well, we have to have enough faith to understand that this is God's church. It will exist as long as he chooses for it to exist, and it will cease to exist when he decides 
it will cease to exist. And I don't mean the church in general. I mean, like our parish. Yes. Um, and that if we were to go the way of Israel and sacrifice our ideals for the sake of money or whatever else, God will turn his face away from us because we turned our face away from him. But if we are faithful and just accept that he can provide for us in the same way that he protected Israel from the Assyrians and sent his angel to destroy the Assyrians, you know, if we stand by our ideals, God will provide for us. And and it's a, it requires faith for that to happen. And not everybody has that level of faith sometimes. So. Okay, chapter four. So we're going around the horn this way, so I guess I'll jump in there. Thank you. <laughs> We've all been conditioned in school. Um, <laughs> we're doing great. Pre reading this, I need to use my Charlton Heston voice, I think. <laughs> And it shall come to pass in the last days <laughs> that the mountain of the Lord will be revealed. It will be raised up on top of the mountains, and it will be exalted far above the hills. And people, peoples will hasten to it, and many nations will go there and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God in ja of Jacob. They will teach us his ways, and we will walk in, in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples, and rebuke, uh, re rebuke, the, uh, rebuke strong nations afar, afar off. Uh, they will beat the swords into plowshares, and their spears into sickles. Nation shall no more lift up the sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall be at rest under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord Almighty has spoken these things. For all the people shall walk each one his own way, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, says the Lord, I shall gather her who has been broken, and I will welcome her who has been ex exiled, even those who I have rejected. And I shall make her who has been broken into a remnant, and her that was rejected into a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion henceforth and forever. And you, O daughter of Zion, dark tower of the flock, on you it will come to uh, it will come and enter in even the former kingdom of Babylon to the daughter of Jerusalem. And now why have you experienced such evils? Why was there no king in your midst? Why did you counsel? Why did your counsel perish? For your birth pangs have seized you uh, as one in labor. Suffer birth pain, uh, pains and take courage. O daughter of Zion, and draw near like a woman giving birth, for now you will be exiled from the city, and you will abide in the flat open country, and you will have come as far off as Babylon, and from that place the Lord your God shall redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Now many nations have gathered against you, saying, We will rejoice, and our eyes, our, our eyes will gaze upon Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor perceive his counsel. For he gathered them like sheaves for their threshing floor. Arise and thresh them, O daughter of Zion, for I make you horns iron, and make your horns iron, and I will make your hooves bronze, and you will cause the nations to melt away, and you will winnow many people, peoples. You will dedicate their abundance to the Lord and their strength to the Lord of all the earth. Now the daughter of Ephraim will be blockaded by a siege wall, for he ordered affliction against us, and they shall smite the tribes of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. Okay, so much of that is talking about the church, right? I mean, especially when it talks about in the day I shall gather her, verse 6, all the female references there. 
are in reference to the fact that the ecclesia in Greek is a female uh, verb. And so it's referring to the church as being her, again, the bride of Christ, Christ being the bridegroom. So a lot of the, that has re reference to the church there. Um, you know, verse one, and it shall come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the Lord will be revealed. Uh, again, the mountain is the church of Christ. And so this is, again, much about the, the church. Two and many nations will go there and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. They'll teach us his ways and we'll walk in his paths. Uh, for out of Zion, the law shall go forth. Now remember, Mount Zion is where the law is given, crucifixion, resurrection, the new covenant, as opposed to Mount Sinai, where the law that Moses received was. Okay, so very clearly, we're not talking about the law of Moses here. We're talking about the law that is established in Zion by Christ in, in the church. Uh, verse 3, and, and he will judge between many peoples and rebuke the strong nations afar off. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into sickles. Um, yeah, again, the, the martyrs willingly die for the faith instead of fighting. Um, and we're, we're reaping here. We're gathering people in as opposed to killing people off. For but everyone shall be at rest under his own vine and under his own fig tree. Remember, Christ is the true vine. And then the withered fig tree that did not bear fruit. Um, here it's kind of the opposite. But everyone shall be at rest under his own vine and under his own fig tree. And no one shall make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord Almighty has spoken these things. Um, for all the people shall walk in his own, own way, but will walk in the name of the Lord, uh, our God forever. So again, just establishing the church within the peoples here. It's a reference to the church. So... Okay, verse 5, or chapter 5, first part of this is going to be very familiar to you, hopefully. And you, O Bethlehem, house of Prophet, though you are fused in number among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler of Israel. His goings forth were from the beginning, even from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the appointed time for her to give birth. And then the remnant of their bro brothers will return to the sons of Israel. And he shall stand and see and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. And they will dwell in the glory of the name of the Lord, their God. For now they will be magnified unto the ends of the earth. And she will have peace for when the Assyrian comes into our land and goes up upon our country. Then seven shepherds and eight attacks from men will ra be raised up against them. They will tend the Assyrian with the sword and the land of Nimrod in her trench. And he shall deliver you from the Assyrian should he come into your land, and should he come up over your borders, and the remnant of Jacob will be among the nations, in the midst of many peoples as dew falling from the Lord, and as lambs in a field of grass, in order that none among the sons of men may assemble together nor resist. And the remnant of Jacob will be amongst the nations, in the midst of many peoples as a lion among the cattle in the forest, and as a young lion among the flock of sheep, which whenever it passes through, seizes and carries off its prey, and there is none to rescue. But your hand will be exalted above the, those oppressing you, and all your enemies will be completely cut off. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, I shall utterly destroy your horses from, the, the, from your midst and destroy your chariots. And I shall utterly destroy the cities of your land and de demolish all your strongholds. And I shall drive away your, your sorceries out of your hands, and there shall be no soothsayers among you. I shall utterly destroy your carved images and the sacred pillars from your midst, and you will no longer worship the work of your hands. And I shall cut off your sacred groves from, from your midst and destroy your cities. I shall ex exact vengeance on the nations with wrath and anger among those who did not heed. So verse 1 should be very familiar from Christmas. The, the prophecy that the Messiah would come from uh, Bethlehem. It's even Jesus himself says, you know, where does the Messiah come? Well, he comes from Bethlehem, land of Judah. They, the, the Pharisees even quote that. But again, they don't recognize that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, even though he was called Jesus of Nazareth. So they thought he was from Nazareth. And they said, search the scriptures. You'll see nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Well, he was born in Bethlehem. <laughs> so a little caveat there. Um, 
But then, uh, and then verse three, um, and he shall stand and see and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, and they will dwell in the glory of the name of the Lord their God. For now they will be magnified unto the ends of the earth. So Christ the good shepherd, we bear his name as Christian, uh, all those things, again, referring to um, his incarnation. And again, it, it, it references again that the Assyrians will be utterly destroyed. If you just trusted me, the Assyrians will be cut off and we have to do the same thing spiritually. If we trust in God, the demons will be uh, kept away from us. But uh, like, that's kind of daunting when you think about it. It's like in analogy, Assyrians are coming. There's a great big army. You've already seen what the heck they did to all the other cities They're bearing down on you. And it says, just trust me. And you're just going, you're getting pretty close. You're getting really close. That's a little clue too close. All right, now yeah, I know you're just messing with me. Oh, you ain't doing anything, are you? Oh, now I don't think you did it. Whereas in our own life, we end up with situations where you feel like you're just you're not making any progress or whatever the fit it is. You know, you're having difficulty with your prayer life, you're having issues with this with money, or you don't know how to do this, and you're just kind of like this is coming to an head, this is coming to an head, and then just have faith it comes in. If you don't, well, obviously what you're afraid of it just happens because well, you didn't have faith. And so that kind of analogy is what I see when you made that statement. Yes. Yeah, we have the same spiritual experience. The, the Syrians are closing in on us, and what do we do about it? Do we have faith, or do we trust in our own resources and you know make a deal with Egypt to try and bring them in to protect us? So. But what we think is the is the right end of the story is oftentimes not what God sees as the mm -hmm. end of the story. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people so truly believe if I can just, if you just believe this is going to happen and you just say, God, I believe it's going to happen, I know, and I'm going to believe and, and then it doesn't happen. Or, you know, I'm, I believe that, that my loved one is going to live and how did you, how dare you let them die, God? And it's like, but that was God's taking care of you now. Yes. No matter how that happened, but we say, well, we'll turn our face away. Or, and I mean, I see this all the time. And, and it's very, um, and you see, you see verses from Micah, people paste things on the, tape things to the wall, different readings. They open a Bible to a verse that they're repeated. If I just say that mantra, if I see that, if I put it over where, if I post it, my, I know that God wants my child to get better. And sometimes that get better on the other side. And it's very poignant and it's very, you know, that's, that's where your faith really gets tested mm -hmm. as the family, but also as a physician, it's like, you know, why is it that it is? It's just where we are right now. There's also be a new test to that aspect, but say, if I, for in the case of a father, trusting that the vengeance is in the hands of the Lord versus you taking hands in your own, taking matters mm -hmm. into your own hand. I myself harm my child. Oh no, I rather just avoid the situation because this is not something that I want to deal with. I don't know if I would be able to let go and just trust. Like, I mean, I have the time. You might get him in the jail cell for all I know, but I got to be trusting in the Lord that you will handle it. Vengeance will be your hand. I am your servant. Anyone who harms your servant will answer to the king. Mm -hmm. Who are we to? Who are we? We're not the king, but the servant. Just trust in the king and his judgment and his vengeance. Pray for them too, because that's one heck of a vengeance. But mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the uh, our we are very myopic. Mm -hmm. We are very short sighted. Mm -hmm. And if we think that if we take care of it here and now, then it's done. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Whereas God is an eternity. And you know, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord, to, in, in Romans twelve. 
We may not even see that vengeance in this lifetime, but there's a whole nother lifetime to deal with. And as you said, I mean, you know, yes, we all want our children to grow and be healthy and successful and everything else. And you see a lot of it where that doesn't happen. And the natural emotional state of humanity is how can this happen? Whereas take out the emotion, now they're with God, right? And and they were taken before they could really get into the sinfulness that we all have entered into, right? And so, you know, they're far more innocent than than we are, and their their likelihood of being with the Lord is, is greater than ours. So maybe God did take care of them in a better way than, than we could imagine them to have done so. It's a hard thing because, you know, again, we're myopic. We're very short-sighted in, in how we see things. Um, one of the parents that I grew up with uh, just passed away in, in Modesto, and she was about 65 years old or so, um, got pancreatic cancer, stage four in, in mid-January and passed away a couple of days ago. Um, you know, for all of us, um, we see it as a tragedy, and for us, it is a tragedy, but um, she could have done radiation and treatment and whatnot. She chose not to. She said, for another three or four months, I'm ready. This is what God has my, in plan for me. And, you know, her her faithfulness, I mean, one of her children is, is a priest uh, in California as well. So, I mean, you know, she raised, she had faith herself and raised her children with faith. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a sad thing for all of us because, you know, we lost somebody that we know, but she was ready. She had the long-term vision of things, you know, why do I need to stick around when I can say my good goodbyes and, and live out my life? Uh, and that's, I think, a, a better spiritual approach than a lot of us have. But, uh, and, you know, sometimes you, you see you, these Assyrians, they come up a whole lot, you know, like you learn a lot more from your mistakes mm -hmm. than you do from your mistakes successes, right? right? Correct. Oh yeah, learn genius. A lot. Huh? I must be a genius. <laughs> I, I feel the same way, John. But they keep in the in these prophets, they keep referring back to the Assyrians. It's like you made a major mistake, mm -hmm. a major mistake, and the prophets from God say, keep saying you screwed up. You didn't listen then. You're not listening now. You're probably not going to listen again. But I still love you. So give it a try this time, but good luck to, you know, those Assyrians are going to haunt you human beings forever because we don't know how not to make a mistake. Right. And I think that's, to me, it's kind of like they keep coming up and you're like, right. <laughs> Even, you know, your parents are gone and, and you still hear them in your ear. You know, like I still hear my mom telling me, you know, I have my dad here, but that's parents. And I'm sure mom is still saying, you idiot, what you do that for, right? So it, that, I think that's what the Assyrians, <laughs> the Assyrians are there. Oh, his mother, I mean, God bless her. She was a tough lady, but, you know, it's, I think they're there for God to say, look, this is the biggest example I can show you. Yes. And then when my son like that that's what you did that's bigger than those assyrians right and it's you know it's again because we don't have the prophet saying it right it's the disciples who saw jesus preach and do all these miracles saw it with their eyes and even even after all of that they're like oh god i, I don't know what do we do, now? <laughs> what do, we do? is we're going to survive and it's like they're like wow that that just happened, didn't it? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, and no. the ladies went and said, we're, we're going to go take care of this body. And then he wasn't there. He's gone. But oh, if, if, if sure? the disciples can do that, yeah. what chance do we have to? The reading know? today, Peter. No. Yeah. I, I don't know him. Sorry. But the funny thing is, I 
Modesto actually Turlock has a very large Assyrian population. And so I grew up with a lot of Assyrians. And see, in your face. They're right there. <laughs> and they converted. I, I didn't I didn't learn a lot of the language, but one word I did learn was to say how to say what, which is mu. And so if you uh, we would see a, a group of guys talking and speaking in the Syrian, just walk up behind them and go mu. And they're like, Start to repeat stuff. Move. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, anyway, you had to have some fun. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. Chapter six. I hear the word of the Lord. The Lord says, "Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. And hear, O mountains, the judgment of the Lord in your valleys, the foundation of the earth. For the Lord has a case against His people." And he will contend with Israel, my people, what have I done to you? How have I grieved you? Answer me, for I brought you up to the land, from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent you to Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember now that what King Balak of Moab plotted against you and what answer Balaam, the son of Beor, gave to him from the reeds as far as to the Gilak, Gilgal and the righteousness of the Lord might be known. How shall I come to do you understand the Lord and devote myself to the most high God? Shall I reach him with burnt offerings, with year-old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with myriad of streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my ungodliness, the fruit of my body, or for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. Or what does the Lord seek from you but to do justly and to love mercy and to be ready to walk with the Lord your God? The Lord's voice shall be proclaimed in the city. He will shall save those who fear his name. Hear, O tribe, who will put the city in order. For there is not a fire there in the house of the lawless, storing up lawless treasures with insolent unrighteousness. Will the lawless be justified by a balanced scale or a bag of deceitful weights from which they accumulated their ungodly wealth? And those that dwell in the city have spoken lies and insulted themselves with their own mouth. Therefore, I will bring to smite you. I will destroy you because of your sins. You shall not, you shall eat, but not be satisfied. And there will be darkness upon you, and you will depart without being noticed. And you will not be rescued. And all who do escape will be given over to the sword. You will sow, but you will not reap. You will press olives, but you will not anoint yourself with oil. You will make wine, but you will not drink any of it. And the statutes of my people will be utterly abolished. For you have kept the ordinance of Amri and done all the works of the house of Ahab. You walked in their counsel so that you so that I should deliver you over to complete destruction and make your inhabitants into a hissing, and you will bear the reproach of the peoples. So verse three there, oh my people, what have I done to you, etc. That's Holy Week, right? Holy Thursday mm -hmm. on is what have I done to you? Answer me. What have you, I gave you all these things? And so um, you know, beautiful hymnology there. Uh, six and seven sacrifices, not what God wants, but to follow his commandments. Again, a, a theme that we've heard over and over and over again. Um, and, and verse eight again, um, he has shown you, oh man, what is good. You know, again, not don't speak good. He's shown you what is good. <laughs> do it. He's shown you the way. Uh, he, doesn't, he hasn't just preached to you how to do it. He's, he's given you the example of what to do there. Um, and again, the, you know, the, um, deceitful weights uh right when you're doing weights and measures you just have to have it be a half an ounce off multiplied over multiple times you can get a lot of wealth that way right so i mean you know the balance of justice etc cetera, etc cetera. so um you know just again imagery here of you know you've done evil now now we have the retribution so um and the establishment of the church. So, chapter seven to finish off. Would you say that it is a like in this, but rather a God revealed way of life? Yes, God teaches us how to how to live, and, and not only I mean in in the, the scriptures, but then Christ literally came and <laughs> this is how you live. <laughs> so. I forget my glasses. John can't read, so he can't see. All right. <clears throat> Mom, do you want to read or or Susan? Chapter seven. Mom, you're muted. I'm the reader. Okay. 
Woe is me, for I have become like one harvesting stubble, like one gleaming small grapes after the vintage grapes are picked, but not finding myself for any cluster of the first fruit to eat. Woe is me, O, o my soul, for the God-fearing man has perished from the earth, and there was no one upright among the men. They all lie in wait, even, even, sorry, unto blood, and each one grievously oppresses his neighbor. They prepare their hands for evil. The prince demands a gift, and the judge speaks flattering words. It is the desire of their soul. Thus I shall take away their good things as the moth, who eats away, and as one who, proceeding by the rule of the day, in the day of the watch. Alas, alas, the time of your vengeance is come. Now shall be their lamentation. Do not trust in friends, nor put your hope in those who govern. Beware of your wife and do not tell her anything. <laughs> For a son, <laughs> a daughter shall rise up against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her a mother-in-law. A man's enemies are all the people of his own house. But I will look to the Lord, for I will wait for God my Saviour, for my God will... Oh, we lost her. Oh, we lost her. She got dropped from the call. She didn't like it. That's what you get for laughing at. She That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll finish up from verse seven then. But I will look to the Lord. I will wait for God, my Savior, for my God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy, for though I have fallen, yet I will arise. Because even if I should sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will endure the wrath of the Lord, for I sinned against him until he pleads my cause. For he will execute my judgment, will bring me out into the light, and I will perceive his righteousness. And my enemy will see it, and he who says to me, Where is the Lord your God? will be clothed with shame, and my eyes will look upon him, and now he will be for trampling upon as mud in the streets. In the days when your bricks are being plastered, that, that day will be your destruction, and your ordinances will be abolished. In that day, even your cities will be leveled to the ground, and you're dividing among the Assyrians. Your fortified cities will be divided from Tyre as far as the river of Syria. It will be a day of flood and chaos, and the land will become totally desolate, together with those dwelling in it, because of the fruit of your, their practices. Shepherd your people with your staff, the sheep of your inheritance, those dwelling solitarily in the thicket in the midst of Carmel. They will feed in Bashan and Gilead in, as in days of old, and, and as in the days of your departure from the land of Egypt, you will see many wonders. The Gentiles will see and be ashamed of all their might. They will cover their mouth with their hands, and their ears will become deaf. They shall lick the dust like serpents crawling on the earth. They will be confounded in their confinement and be amazed at the Lord our God, and they will be afraid of you. Who is like a God? Who is a God like you? Removing wrongdoings and passing over the ungodliness of the remnant of his inheritance. He does not keep his anger as a witness, for he delights in mercy. He will return and have compassion on us. He will subdue our transgressions, and all our sins will be cast into the depths of the sea. He will give truthfulness to Jacob and mercy to Abraham as he swore to our ancestors from days of old. And so, again, the Lord, uh, one, woes me, for I have become like one harvesting stubble, like one gleaning grapes after the vintage grapes are picked. Uh, it's the Lord who harvests, but does he find any fruit among us? So, again, you know, the important thing is for us to bear fruit so that when he's harvesting, he has something to harvest from us. Um the part that we laughed at, uh, <laughs> Christ actually uh, quotes directly in Matthew 10, 35 and 36 and Luke 12, 53. It's, it's knows twice um, uh, there that, um, you know, that we can't even trust in, in our kinsfolk and whatnot. We have to trust in God. God's still a little unhappy about that, that eating the apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. And 18, then who is a God like you removing wrongdoings and passing? Christ shows his divinity by forgiving our sins. Um, but, you know, we're going to sing this on, on Sunday of Orthodoxy. Who is a God as great as our God, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, uh, reference. On the, um, the, uh, about during the Adventist service, 
the agape service. Yeah, it's a few times throughout the year, but it's a beautiful hymn. Um, but again, just reminding who, who, what God is there that is like our God. It's like so. saying, King of King, Emperor of Emperor, God of Gods. Correct. So, okay, so that was the, the book of Micah, very short book, but again, um, dovetailing again with Isaiah, with Amos, with Hosea. Um, Again, so many things referencing when, when Christ comes and, and the church is established that you can look back and say, okay, there's the prophecy that is being fulfilled here in Christ. So um, next week, before we start our pre-sanctifieds, I think we'll go through the book of Joel and maybe um, talk about what, where we want to go from there uh, come next season for Bible studies. So. Did you get something I sent you about the uh, saint? Uh, I texted you one morning about 